of us in Mumbai, this was a wonderful compromise. And I'm thrilled to see so many of you are signing in. And I, again, uh, will reiterate Dutch's suggestion that you put it in speaker mode so that um, Dinyar and his PowerPoint and all of that will be bigger on the screen rather than seeing the Brady Bunch. Um, this morning's program is actually thanks to one of my dearest friend's suggestion last May. She is a member and, a, as I said, a very dear friend, and she sent me a copy of the Wall Street Journal's inter, uh, review of Dinyar Patel's book on Naroji and said that the review was glowing. And I read the review and it was more than glowing. It was just riveting. And then I looked down and saw that he was at that point a professor at the University of South Carolina in Columbia. And obviously I thought, well, we can get him down here. He's, he's only two hours away. So I went online, contacted him, and he explained that he'd actually left and was a professor at uh, an institute in Mumbai, but that he's thrilled that South Carolinians were following his progress and would love to do a program. So we started actually working on Dinyar's participation before we had done many Zoom calls at all. And this is our very first international uh, program for the Library Society. I, I've got to say that it is a fabulous book. It, it may have been his PhD at Harvard, but it does not read like a PhD dissertation. It's been turned into a very, very accessible narrative history of a fascinating period in obviously India's history. In fact, my husband and I, uh, after I finished, went and rented Gandhi because I kept hoping that I would find a scene in Gandhi where uh, Gandhi goes and to the grand old man of India to get some advice. And obviously he did have a relationship with Naroji, but Unfortunately, in the movie, we don't see Naroji, but uh, I want to thank Dinyar Patel, professor of the SP Jain Institute of Management and Research in Mumbai, who actually grew up in California, but uh, spent eight years in Cambridge, Massachusetts at Harvard, and then ended up in South Carolina, where I thought we were going to be able to have him in person, but has ended up in Mumbai. It's such a wonderful opportunity to have you with us, and I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to thank Anne and everyone else at the Library Society for inviting me here. Thanks for everyone who's shown up. Uh, you know, I, I would have loved to have come in, in person, uh, but, you know, this is the best we can do, obviously, right now. Um, I, I'll just make a note that, uh, you know, internet connection can be a little unstable at times. So, um, you know, I, I think it'll be fine, but, you know, I might, you might get one or two disturbances along the way. Um, let me go ahead and, and start my presentation. All right. I think um, can you can you can you see the slides? Okay, great. So um, the topic of my presentation today is you know is, is about someone probably many of you have never heard of. Uh, you know, I, I, you know. So I'll, I'll talk about kind of broad themes that uh, relate to this in terms of, of, of uh, you know history, not just in India but but elsewhere around the world. Um, the first ever. Indian or, or even Asian to be elected to the British House of Commons was uh, the topic of, of my book, Dadabai Naroji. And, and this took place in, in the year 1892, uh, which begs the question, how did an Indian get elected uh, that long ago, right? In, in, in an era when there was quite a lot of racism and it, it was very unusual for someone like an Indian uh, to be elected to the Parliament of Great Britain. Um, another question relates to something called Indian nationalism. Um, Indian nationalism is the term that's used uh, to describe the Indian independence movement, um, which is 
which in early stage was not necessarily independence. It was, uh, that was not the goal. The goal was some form of political autonomy, more political rights. And eventually, through the help of people like Dadabai Naroji, it, it became something like independence. Um, and the third question, which will kind of guide my presentation, is, is how America featured uh, in the story. Uh, it was always there in the background. I mean, there is a, a much longer story of uh, America in Indian history that, that is waiting to be written. There are, there are a few books that have been written on the topic, but a lot more can be said. Uh, so let me begin with that. You know, th this is the book that uh, I've written. Uh, thanks again to Anne for, for her, her uh, kind words about it. Uh, and, and the individual I'll be talking about lived for 91 years. I mean, he was, he was born very early in, in the, the 19th century, and he, he passed away in 1917, just as World War I was, was ending. So it was a very long and eventful life. Um, and it began in, in Bombay. I mean, Narochi was born in the city of Bombay, and, and he came from a community called the Parsi community. I'm a Parsi myself. We're, we're a very small community of uh, Zoroastrians, basically the, the people um, and the people who followed the religion in Iran before Islam came, and uh, many of us fled to India uh, due to re religious persecution, and uh, most of us ended up in, in Bombay by the 19th century, and, and this is where uh, Naroji was born. He was born into a, a very poor family. Uh, his family had fled from Gujarat to the north of Bombay because of famines and poverty, uh, which were hallmarks of British rule. Um, so even though this was a relatively foreign setting, there, there were certain commonalities between, you know, what, what you all are used to in, in, in the south, in Charleston. I mean, if you, if you look at this photo, uh, the people at the very front uh, who are sitting on things, they're sitting on cotton bales. Uh, because, you know, Bombay was in many ways kind of the Charleston of, of India, in the sense of being a major cotton port, where cotton was, uh, you know, taken uh, uh, in order to export to uh, places like Boston or, or Manchester and, and places like that. So, you know, just like South Carolina, Bombay's economy was uh, based on, on cotton in this era. Uh, and it, it was slowly emerging into a much more diverse cosmopolitan environment, uh, you know, by um, the time Naroji is born, it, will, it had become one of the big up-and-coming cities in India, and it, it eventually becomes India's most cosmopolitan uh, city and the biggest city by, by the 20th century. Uh, it, it was a place of stunning diversity. There were, you know, where, where, where Dadabai Naroji was born, uh, the neighborhood was home to people who were Jewish, people who were Muslim, Hindu, Christian. Uh, there was an American printing press not far away from where Naroji was born, which was an operation by the 1830s. Um, there was, you know, a, a large palace owned by a, a Jewish, a wealthy Jewish individual not far from him. Uh, ports, the port, which was right next to where Naroji grew up, uh, hosted ships from all across the world. Uh, so it was in many ways kind of a, a global city. Uh, but it was a city that was also marked with, with great poverty. Um, and when Naroji grew up, he was one of the few people, a uh, few Indians at this time, who received any form of education. Um, and education for him was, was very basic. Uh, he joined what was called a Pachala, uh, which was a traditional Indian school where a teacher would teach a group of, of, of boys, and it was always boys, uh, on the street. You know, people would meet on the street, they would meet maybe in a temple or a mosque, uh, and they'd practice things like writing and okay. Uh, so this was a very basic education, but it was cheap, uh, it was accessible to poor people. Um, and Naroji immediately, uh, you know, was identified as, as an unusually bright pupil. Uh, and for this reason, uh, he was given the opportunity to uh, attend a, a pretty novel experiment that took place uh, in Bombay in the, in the early 19th century, uh, which was an attempt at public education. Um, in the early 19th century, public education was, was really rare around the world. I mean, whether you were in India or Great Britain or, or even the United States, uh, it was not something that was done. Uh, and there was an attempt that was done to provide, um, you know, free education to anyone in, in, in Bombay at this time, uh, which got off the ground. It, you know, it was, it was a joint effort with both British and Indians managing it. And Naruti was, was one of the people who was selected to take part in this. So here you have a child of, of, peop, of poor parents who had fled, uh, you know, famine-stricken districts in, in Gujarat, and he's given the opportunity to learn, um, you know, Western educational topics like philosophy and science, and learn the English language. It was, it was, a, it was an incredible break uh, for him. Uh, and this was something that Naroji remembered for the rest of his life. I mean, for him, 
uh, his educational experience was was absolutely foundational. Um, and it, it led to this. I mean, this is this is a picture of uh, someplace called Elphinstone College, which was the the biggest educational institution in Western India um, in the mid 19th century. Uh, this is the building that survives today. Um, at Naroji's time, it was a different building, but you know, th this was the best place to go for an education in all of Western India uh, in the 20th, in the in the early 19th century. Uh, and Naroji again was one of the people lucky enough to go here. So you know, again, so in in his very early li life, he rose from an extremely humble background to being someone who got you know the best of the best in terms of educational opportunities for free uh, or for you you know, or with scholarships. Um, and quite naturally, Naroji from this point onward became a, a staunch advocate of expanding educational opportunities uh, beyond just the few people who are lucky enough to, to, to get it. Um, he distinguished himself, himself particularly in math. Uh, so after he finished college, he actually joined his college as a, as a faculty member, uh, first as an, an acting professor, then an assistant professor, and finally as a full professor. He was the first full uh, professor uh, who was Indian uh, in India ever, uh, you know, at, at a government college. Uh, so, you know, he was already uh, really, you know, in, in his educational uh, efforts, you know, rising to the as far as he could go. Uh, and he was particularly strong in mathematics. Uh, he was also very good in things like uh, physics, um, political economy, uh, study of, uh, you know, kind of, you know, the economic conditions of, of India, even things like astronomy. Uh, he was quite good at. Uh, so, you know, from the start, he had a very strong backing in kind of ideas of rationalism, empirical research. Uh, you know, he, he read a lot about, you know, people who figured in the Scottish Enlightenment from the, uh, the late 1700s and the early 1800s. So he's getting, you know, a very strong kind of like rational, uh, you know, Enlightenment era type education in India. Uh, and he's sharing this with other Indians. Uh, and this influences his, his early career. Um, while he is, you know, uh, you know, rising through the ranks as a professor, uh, he begins uh, to take part in, in local politics and, and social, you know, social life in Bombay. Uh, and one of the things he starts, uh, he helped start in Bombay was uh, female education for Indians. Um, up until the 1850s, most, the vast majority of Indian, Indian women, 99.9% you know, .9 would not have got any form of schooling whatsoever. Uh, a lucky few got schooling at home. Uh, there were a, a few uh, women's uh, schools started by, you know, foreign missionaries. Uh, but by and large, most Indians, Indian women had no access to education. Uh, and so Naroji joined a few of his peers at Elphinstone College in starting uh, a network of world schools, um, which at first were not uh, very popular uh, because a lot of Indian men did not want their, 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 their daughters to be educated. But you know, Naroji persisted, and within time, the, these schools were enrolling hundreds upon hundreds of uh, young girls in, in Bombay, and they became, uh, you know, kind of catalytic in this process of promoting female education in Western India. Uh, so throughout his life, he advocated uh, female education uh, in India, uh, and this is where, you know, it really began. I mean, he, he was one of the, the founders of, the, of this movement in, uh, in Bombay, and he did this to a large degree without British help. I mean, the British did not provide much funding for, for him. Uh, so he got money and support from other Indians and it was a, a way for him to kind of patch together alliances uh, which helped uh, him later in his political career. Uh, he helped uh, start a movement called Young Bombay, uh, which was similar to you know, other movements around the world, Young Italy, um, Young Bengal in India. Uh, and this was again, you know, kind of a movement that had reform at its very heart. So, uh, Indians were talking about religious reform, social reform, getting rid of certain orthodox religious practices, and eventually political reform. Uh, so Naroji was, again, one of the first few Indians in Bombay to start talking about their political rights uh, and start talking about how colonial rule was, uh, you know, was not always good. You know, at, at the very beginning, they oftentimes were quite laudatory and quite positive towards colonial rule, but they, they started to kind of ask themselves, what was wrong with it, and uh, why Indians were not allowed uh, many political rights. Uh, so this provided a political foundation, not just for Naroji, but for many other early Indian political figures. Um, but at this time, uh, in the year 1855, Naroji decides to make a, a, a big transition in his life. Uh, he decides to move to London. Uh, 
Um, this, again, was quite unusual for the time. Uh, very few Indians went abroad, um, and the few who did, mostly did for you know, mercantile reasons. Uh, Nauruti decides to move to Liverpool and London in, in order to help set up a Indian commercial firm in Great Britain. Uh, and not surprisingly, it dealt with cotton. I mean, the, the goods that you see on the wharf in this picture are again cotton bales. Um, and so Nauruti goes for the first time ever to Europe, uh, and he's blown away by how rich and prosperous uh, London is. Uh, you know, he travels through France and he's amazed by the technological innovations that he sees in France, railways, dams, canals. Um, and he's immediately struck by how poor India is in comparison uh, with, with Europe. Uh, and this, again, becomes an influential basis for his later work. Uh, now, Narochi starts to think about why India is so poor in comparison to the rest of the world. And, and there, there are two things which really uh, get him to kind of think about this in new and novel ways. And, and one is an event you all are familiar with, the, the American Civil War. Um, the American Civil War was in many ways a global event. Uh, when the Civil War occurred, uh, the cotton that was shipped from places like Charleston uh, or Mobile stopped, right? So, you know, the whole gear, uh, you know, gear shafts of the industrial economy in, in the West came to a grinding halt. It was based on cotton and textile manufacture. Uh, and now mills in Boston or, 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 or Liverpool or Manchester or Lancashire had no access to cotton. Uh, so they got cotton instead from India. So Indian cotton was going to uh, the Northeast in America or to England, uh, providing uh, cotton that America would have provided initially. Uh, and as a result, Indian merchants, including Nairobi, got tremendously wealthy, uh, but then got, you know, went completely bankrupt when the American Civil War uh, ended and America re-entered the cotton scene. So, so immediately you had this, you know, experience of a boom and a bust, a great profit, and then bankruptcy, uh, which got, again, people like Nairobi thinking of how India was tied into the global economy. Uh, and the other thing that really got Nairobi thinking about poverty uh, was a spate of terrible famines that took place in uh, British India uh, in the late 19th century. Now, for those of us who study uh, colonialism in, in, in India, one, one glaring fact is that India grew much, much poorer under British colonial rule for, for various factors. Uh, but one symptom of this poverty was uh, these famines that took place between roughly the 1860s uh, and the early 1900s. Uh, and these famines were devastating uh, in size and consequence. I mean, you know, we, we all know of the Irish potato famine uh, that took place in the 1840s, where, you know, at least a million people died, another million people immigrated. Uh, well, in India, this was happening every few years. I mean, during one famine uh, in the 1870s, which you see on the screen, uh, the Madras famine from 1876, five million people died. Uh, which you know, was a huge percentage of the population. Um, and the famine which caught Naroji's attention was something called the Orissa famine, where one million or one out of every three people in one uh, particular area of India died. Uh, so again, this caused Naroji to think about why India was so vulnerable to things uh, like mass famine. Um, and so he started to investigate poverty in Great Britain. And he did so in a very empirical, mathematical way um, and he started to devise economic data that showed that India was grievously poor, far poorer than, you know, anything that had been uh, assumed by British Indian authorities at this time. Uh, he calculated the first statistics for gross uh, income in India and, you know, GDP per head. Uh, and what he discovered was that, uh, you know, the average Indian earned about two pounds every year, which, which doesn't mean much anything by itself. Uh, but when you compare it to the fact that the average uh, British individual was earning 33 pounds, you therefore got a ratio that, that showed that Indians were, you know, 15 times poorer uh, than the average Brit, who, by, you know, by, by, by any stroke of luck at this time, is, is not rich anyway, right? I mean, the average Britain uh, anyway in, in the, the late 1900s is quite poor. Uh, they're industrial workers. So you can imagine how much poorer people were in India. Um, and this was why... Uh, Indians were so vulnerable towards, uh, towards uh, pov mass poverty and famine. Uh, Indians were being taxed to a very high degree. Uh, and when, you know, a small natural disaster happened, like failure of rains or, you know, an earthquake or, uh, you know, a heat wave, uh, natural disaster very quickly developed into something like famine. 
So famine did not happen because of natural disasters themselves. Uh, they happened because of the fact that Indians were already so poor and British policy was not helping them uh, you know, overcome poverty, get richer, and help with famine. So, so here is a direct link that Naroji um, creates between mass poverty in India and British colonial rule. And this was not a very popular um, idea, you know, as you can imagine. I mean, most British would have balked at the idea that uh, colonialism was causing poverty, uh, but it, it set in train a, a, a series of thoughts that Naroji developed during uh, the period from the 1860s to the 1880s. You know, first of all, that India was growing poorer and poorer every year uh, because of British rule, uh, that the British were actually draining wealth out of India. Uh, Naroji actually calculated that out of all the taxes collected every year in India, one fourth of those taxes were drained off to Great Britain and you know went into British bank accounts. So so every year one fourth of the you know the gross wealth of India was being taken out of the country uh, and put into the English economy. And quite naturally, uh, you know India grew poorer. Um, the reason um, you know the the. the the, the solution that Naroji hit upon uh, to stop this drain of wealth and to stop this increased poverty uh, was to replace British officers in the government with Indian officers. Um, Indian officers would, uh, you know, be much more willing to, uh, you know, create economic policy that would help Indians rather than British people. Uh, you know, they, they would have Indian interests in mind rather than British interests. And they'd also be cheaper. Uh, British uh, officers were being paid tremendous salaries, and those salaries normally went off in pensions and, you know, through, um, uh, you know, remittances back to Great Britain. Uh, whereas in, in India, that salary stayed with the Indian cycle through the, the Indian economy. Uh, so Naroji started to talk about replacing uh, Britons in government in India with Indians. Up until this point in time, again, 99% of people who worked in the important positions of, of government in India were British people. Indians were practically barred from holding any position of importance for various reasons. Uh, and so Naroji wanted to change that. And it was only a step further from that to say, well, you know, in addition to replacing British officers with Indian officers, why don't we get self-government? Uh, now, at this point in time, self-government was, was limited. Naroji was thinking about self-government such as what Canada or Australia had within the British Empire. So you were within the British Empire, the, the, the queen was still the head of state, uh, but by and large you were independent. Okay, so, so you know, through economic thought, he came to this opinion by 1884 that India needed self-government. Uh, and of course, India does not get independence until 1947. So this is very, very early on uh, when anyone is talking about self-government for India. Now, at this stage, Naroji turns his attention from India to Great Britain. He'd, he'd already lived in Great Britain for long periods of time. In 1886, he travels from Bombay, uh, and he stays in London from that point onward all the way up until 1907, with, with a few interruptions on the way. Um, and the reason why he went to, to London at this point in time was because he wanted to actually enter Parliament uh, as an MP. Um, and the reason why he wanted to enter Parliament was... Uh, this. Uh, if you wanted to affect any sort of political change in India, you really could not do it in India. Uh, the government was very reactionary, very conservative, uh, but parliament actually controlled the affairs of the British Indian government. So if you wanted to achieve any sort of meaningful reform, you could do it through parliament. And there were actually people in parliament at the time who actually were quite sympathetic towards India. Uh, so Naroji went to Great Britain. He, he joined the Liberal Party, which was one of the two major political parties at this point in time. Um, people like Gladstone were in this party. Uh, and he tried to cultivate friendly relations with uh, the Liberals in order to stand for election as, a, as an MP. Um, an Indian was not prohibited from standing uh, for Parliament at this point in time. No, no colonial subject was prohibited. You could, you could do it as long as you met a certain income threshold, and as long as you lived in Great Britain for a period of time that you know, was uh, according to law. And Naroji met these categorizations. So he you know, involves himself in the Liberal Party uh, with people like Gladstone and others, but he's also open to other influences. Uh, he forges links with Irish nationalists who are keen to get some sort of autonomy or even independence for, from uh, British rule. Uh, so one very important Irish nationalist, a man called Michael Davitt, 
actually tries to convince Narochi to stand for parliament from Ireland in, in 1887. So Ireland nearly had an Indian standing for parliament uh, and could have had an Indian in the British parliament as its representative. It's, it's quite a crazy idea. But the reason why the Irish and the Indians got along so well was because they realized that they both, both disliked British colonial rule. Uh, they both wanted political rights. And this began you know, decades of cooperation. The, the, the British and the Irish uh, cooperated against colonialism and imperialism through the 1920s and 1940s. Uh, you know, it was the beginning of quite a, a solid relationship. Uh, the other relationship that began with Naroji was a link between uh, Indian nationalism and Indian, Indian politics and socialism. Socialism was just kind of emerging as an important political force. Uh, the man you see on the screen here, uh, Henry Hinman, was the, the founder of the first uh, socialist political party in Great Britain called the Social Democratic Federation. And he was also a good friend of Naroji. Uh, so both Naroji and Hinman talked about how uh, British rule impoverished uh, India. Uh, and Hinman thought, you know, the same political dispensation that caused imperialism was causing the suffering of the working class. Um, and it was through people like Hinman uh, that Naroji's economic ideas got a much wider reception. So, you know, even someone like Karl Marx was exposed to Naroji's economic ideas. Uh, at the very end of Marx's life, um, we know that Naroji, uh, Naroji's idea of a drain of wealth was being thought of and discussed by Karl Marx. Uh, you know, I, do, I don't know if Marx ever met Naroji, but he definitely got wind of his uh, political and economic ideas, which is, which is quite phenomenal. And, you know, an, an Indian is influencing Marx uh, at, at this stage. So these three influences, liberalism, Irish nationalism, and socialism, have a knockoff effect. Uh, when Naroji is in Great Britain, he gets involved in lots of other activities uh, that don't necessarily fit under the rubric of Indian nationalism. Uh, one thing he gets involved in is um, the feminist movement, the movement for women's suffrage. Uh, so Naroji had already been involved in female education in Bombay. He now gets involved in women's rights activities in, in Great Britain. And he befriends pretty much the who's who of women's rights activists uh, in Great Britain at this point in time. Emmeline uh, Pankhurst, um, Ursula Sims-Williams, uh, many other important uh, British uh, feminists. And he becomes a staunch supporter of women's right uh, to vote. Um, and this intersects with broader um, you know, women's rights movements at this time. So you know, at one conference in 1890, uh, Naroji spoke alongside Elizabeth Cady Stanton, the, the, uh, the American uh, uh, you know, women's suffragist, uh, as well as you know, a French suffragist and a, uh, an important Indian uh, woman activist called Rakhmabai. So Naroji is ingratiating himself in a much bigger network of uh, you know, international actors, whether they be socialist, whether they be women's rights activists, and, and these all help him. Uh, you know, when Naroji actually stands for parliament, one, one, you know, one of his most important supporters are women's rights activists who actually go out and help him campaign. Uh, so when Naroji speaks to British audiences about why India is important, uh, he's talking about why it's important from the perspective of things like workers' rights, Irish nationalism, or women's rights to vote. All of these constituencies had in common, uh, you know, lack of political rights. And Naroji said, look, if you as a woman want political rights for yourself, you should sympathize with us as Indians demanding political rights uh, as well. And it was an extraordinary successful uh, strategy. Uh, so when Naroji, you know, campaigned for parliament from a, from a constituency called Central Finsbury, you know, if you look at his political program, uh, it wasn't just about India. Uh, it was about workers' rights. It was about you know the right of women to vote. It was about Irish Home Rule, uh, and this was how an Indian could effectively stand for Parliament. Uh, but it immediately hit upon challenges and roadblocks. I mean, Naroji was still Indian, and this was still the 18, 18, 1880s and 1890s, and so Naroji hit upon uh, you know tremendous veins of racist opposition when he stood for Parliament, um, and you know one of the uh, most significant moments took place when the Prime Minister of Great Britain, a man called Lord Salisbury, who's a conservative, who's, who's featured in this cartoon, called Naroji a black man who did not deserve to be elected uh, to Parliament. And this actually struck the chord of many people in Britain. They thought that Salisbury, the Prime Minister, had gone a step too far. Uh, they, they thought that he had insulted uh, you know, an Indian subject. 
Uh, and so Naruji actually became quite a, a cause celeb, kind of like a, an object of sympathy from a lot of British individuals. Um, and you know, when we, we talk about anti-racism today, uh, anti-racism existed in the 1880s in, in Britain and America and elsewhere as well. Uh, and so a lot of anti-racist act activists um, immediately were drawn to Naroji and said, you know, this is a person who's been wronged by Britain, uh, we should support him as well. Uh, and so Naroji is featured in, in comics at this time. This is a comic from uh, the famous magazine Punch, where Naroji is, is portrayed as Othello. Um, in another magazine, uh, Lord Salisbury, the prime minister, is portrayed as kind of like a, a ruffian or a hoodlum uh, who's painting uh, you know, kind of the stately image of Dadabai Naroji black. So, you know, you see where public sympathies lay over here. Uh, sympathies lay more with Naroji uh, and against this kind of racist attack and, and less with the conservative prime minister. Um, and this has a, you know, an incredible effect. It, it helps Naroji win election uh, in 1892. Uh, he wins by only five votes, which is the reason why, you know, people start calling him Dadabai nar narrow majority. It was, it was easier for uh, Englishman to pronounce this. Um, and, you know, he wins with the help of, of Irish voters. Uh, he wins with the help of women who, even though they can't vote, uh, you know, they canvass uh, Naroji's constituency and, and try to get people to support him. Uh, and so here you have in 1892 a, a truly historic moment where, you know, a colonial subject, an Indian, uh, is now in the House of Commons. Um, and, you know, it, it, it causes... Um, you know, a great deal of celebration both in India and Great Britain. Uh, Indians actually send a, a, a huge book uh, of, of pictures uh, to the, the voters of central Finsbury as, you know, as a token of, tank, of thanks. Uh, and you can still see this book in a museum in London. Uh, but, you know, they basically say, look, this is us. Uh, this is our city, Bombay. As you can see, it's quite modern. You can see that we have political associations and societies. Uh, and, you know, this is a testament to us wanting to be more like you, who have political rights, who can elect uh, people to parliament. Uh, and so this represents kind of like a high point, a high moment in, um, you know, Indian attitudes towards, uh, you know, a, a strategy where they could try to convince British people to support them in their demand for political rights. Um, when Naruji returns to Bombay for the first time after he's elected, 500,000 people are out in the streets uh, to greet him. Uh, which is significant because only a million people lived in Bombay at this point in time. So about one in two people showed up in Bombay to greet him. Um, and Naroji attends something called uh, the Indian National Congress. This, this was a, a political party that was founded in 1885. Uh, and every year it, it held an annual meeting to discuss um, Indian political rights and Indian political demands. Uh, and Naroji led this meeting in 1893. Uh, and he, he again called for people in Great Britain to um, support India's rights and support um, those rights through the British Parliament. Um, and so when Naruji returned to Great Britain, he spent the next few years campaigning in Parliament for Indian political rights. He did so quite forcefully. I mean, on occasion, uh, he compared uh, Indians to um, black slaves in America. And he said, just like you know, African Americans in America, we have we in India have no political rights. We grow extremely poor under you know you know oppressive rule. Uh, we're treated as second class citizens. But ultimately, all of these efforts came to naught. Uh, you know, Naroji could talk about the uh, the absence of rights. Uh, he could talk about the poverty of India. But it was another question altogether about whether anyone would listen to him. Uh, and increasingly, most MPs in Parliament paid less and less attention to him. Um, and in 1895, uh, the ultimate humiliation happened to him. He, he lost his re-election bid. Uh, so here again, you have kind of, you know, you know, a, a tremendous rise and fall in terms of political expectations. Uh, you know, you have uh, ultimate defeat, humiliation take place in 1895. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the political party that wins British elections in 1885 uh, are the conservatives. Lord Salisbury becomes prime minister once more, and they immediately pursue a much more hardline attitude toward British India. So, you know, after the rise, the fall. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's testament to Naroji's political attitudes that he didn't let bitterness and uh, despair overcome him. Uh, he saw this defeat as kind of like a call to kind of step up his activities and become more radical. Uh, and at this point in time, he's in his, he's in his 70s. Uh, so he expands his political views. He becomes more radical. A new famine 
uh, as well as a terrible plague epidemic breaks out in India. So what Naroji does is he steps up his political activities with Irish or socialists, uh, and he campaigns for a more radical political response from Great Britain uh, to help uh, in famine aid. Uh, it's at this point in time that he starts talking about British rule being evil, uh, about how, you know, if the British did not do anything, there might be a, a mass rebellion that would throw out the British by force. Uh, so at this point in time, he's, he's kind of towing the line with laws of sedition uh, that were on the books in British India. But he also expands his political view uh, globally. Uh, he begins talking more and more with Americans, especially Americans who are anti-imperialist. Uh, remember, it's, it's around the same time that America embarks on its own imperial uh, endeavors, uh, specifically with the Spanish-American War, where places like you know, Puerto Rico or the Philippines or Guam come, come under uh, American political rule. Uh, and so Naruji begins communicating with American anti-imperialists, and they start comparing American empire and the British empire. Uh, and immediately some of the uh, American imperialists uh, you know, think to themselves, my God, you know, so here's an Indian who's talked about how British rule has done all these terrible things to colonial subjects. It's made them poor, it's made them like slaves, it's denied them political rights. If we as Americans do the same thing in the Philippines or Puerto Rico, we'll do the exact same thing. Uh, we'll cause terrible poverty, misery, and in the end, it'll just blow back on our face. We'll, you know, it will cause mutiny and insurrection. Uh, so one of the people uh, who embraces Naroji's political views uh, was William Jennings Bryan, uh, the progressive politician uh, you know, from Nebraska who you know, nearly uh, becomes president on two or three occasions. He runs for president, uh, and he becomes kind of the face of anti-imperialism at the stage. Uh, and he, he and others use Naroji's writings to warn against imperialism. And a lot of people listen. I mean, Irish Americans listen. Progressive listen, progressives listen. Some people in, in President Wilson's cabinet are um, amenable to the idea. Um, at the same time, uh, Naroji reaches out to African Americans. Uh, there are African uh, Americans or uh, West Indian uh, blacks who live in London uh, in the 1890s. Uh, and you know they're talking about the same stuff, denial of political rights, poverty, uh, you know, kind of second-class status, uh, uh, you know, in political systems. So one individual, Ida B. Wells, uh, who was born a slave and went on to become a, a journalist and a founder of the NAACP, uh, actually meets with Naroji in the 1890s. And Naroji actually helps uh, form an anti-lynching society in Great Britain uh, in response to Ida B. Wells, uh, you know, uh, talk about, uh, you know, lynching epidemics in the American South. Um, another individual who comes in contact with Naroji, either directly or indirectly, we don't know for sure, uh, is the famous intellectual, intellectual W.E.B. Du Bois. Uh, Naroji and Indians help uh, fund what was called the first Pan-African Conference, which was a meeting that took place in London where uh, African leaders from around the world came to discuss uh, political ideas. So W.E.B. Du Bois was there, leaders from uh, you know, the West Indies were there, leaders from Africa were there, leaders from London were there, and they met together in London and discussed their common uh, ideas. And a few Indians were in the audience as well, uh, you know, kind of sharing notes and, and, and trading ideas. So, you know, all of this is happening. At, at the same time, Naroji reaches out to other Indians who are just starting their political career, uh, and one of them is Gandhi. Uh, you know, as, as Anne mentioned, uh, Naroji and Gandhi shared a political relationship. Um, Gandhi began his political career in South Africa. Uh, so Gandhi looks up to Naroji as kind of a political elder and a senior and looks to him for guidance. Uh, so Naroji gets involved in broader South African affairs. Um, he all gets involved in European socialism. Uh, he, he attends a, a socialist congress in 1904, uh, along with people like Rosa Luxemburg, who is a, a very important Jewish German um, nationalist, uh, you know, a socialist. Uh, other important French socialists like Jean Joars. Uh, so he's enmeshed in broader global socialist networks and he brings Indian political demands into socialist thought. His attention ultimately turns back toward India. And, and this is uh, you know, where I approach the end of my story. Uh, so in the year 1906, Naroji turns uh, 81 years old. Okay, so he, you know, most people at this point in time have long ago left the political field, uh, but this is actually Naroji's most active political year. 
uh, you know, everything builds up to his 80th year. Uh, it's this year he starts to talk more about more about how India needs self-government. Um, at first, he talks about how India needs self-government under something called British paramountcy. So again, the British would be in charge at the top one or two levels, but by and large, India would have uh, self-government in all other spheres. Uh, he tries to uh, get elected for parliament one last time at the age of 80. He loses. Uh, he writes to the British prime minister and, is, and he says, you, you know, you all have done so much wrong in, in India that we demand self-government as reparation. Uh, you know, this is an early example of reparations being used in, you know, dialogues about things like colonialism and slavery. Uh, he meets with Gandhi to talk about, you know, Gandhi's political career and his political trajectory. And lastly, uh, he goes back to India to uh, reside at the annual meeting of the Indian National Congress. Um, and at this time, uh, the Congress is divided into two, into two camps. There's, there's a moderate camp, which wants, you know, kind of, you know, you know, piecemeal progressive reform to take place in India. And, and there's a radical camp that says, no, we just need to get independence right now uh, by violence if necessary. Uh, British rule is bad and we, we must do our best to end it as soon as possible. And Naroti finds himself right in the middle. Uh, you know, he's too radical for the moderates and too moderate for the radicals. I mean, Naroti did not want violence. Uh, he campaigned against it all his life. Uh, but at the same time, he wants something much more immediate than what the moderates want. Uh, so he goes to uh, the Congress meeting that's held in Calcutta, uh, and he delivers an address. Again, he's 81 years old at this time. He's actually too old to actually give the address. Uh, it's given to a younger person who's able to speak better, before microphones, of course. Uh, and in his speech, he looks around the world, and he says, look, Japan is now getting uh, much more developed. It has its own government. Uh, there's been a, a revolution recently in Russia. Uh, where a parliament has been established, the Duma. China is making political reforms. There's been a, a, a constitutional revolution in Persia or Iran, and Iran now has a parliament. India needs the same thing. So he says, India needs self-government, um, or Swaraj, which was the Indian term. Uh, and he says specifically, self-government like the United Kingdom or, the, or its colonies. So what this means is that India can get self-government like Great Britain, where it's a fully autonomous country, or it could get it like you know, Canada or Australia. And, and this is a significant break. This is the first time a major Indian leader is telling uh, Indians, you could just get complete independence. That's perfectly OK. Uh, and it shifts the ball into the court of the radicals in the Congress. Uh, from this point, uh, the radicals really call the shots. Uh, you know, Naruti re retires the following year. Uh, you know, he's, he, um, uh, you know, again, he's 81 years old. He's, he's too old to continue. He tries to enter parliament one more time, but he's in his 81st year, but doesn't work. Uh, but from this point, uh, radicals in the Congress really kind of take the lead and, and others like Gandhi come to the fore. Uh, but Naruti's speech, again, is, is distributed around the world. I mean, one person who reads it and is impressed by it is W.B. Du Bois, who says, you know, here's a, a rousing example of, you know, a colored individual uh, talking about, you know, getting political rights. And so he writes about this to, a, you know, an African-American audience. Um, and that's really where I want to leave you. I mean, you know, Naroji, you know, is eventually eclipsed by people like Gandhi and Nehru uh, in the Indian political tradition, but he still has a great deal of global relevance. I mean, you know, when we think about anti-imperialism in general or, uh, you know, how anti-imperialism meshed with American political traditions or British or Irish ones, Naroji was at the fore in, in all of these venues. Um, so if you want to learn more about Naroji, you know, if you go to my website, I have a few more resources. Um, and I'll end with that, and I'll, I'll be happy to answer any questions in the remaining time we have. Thank you, Dinyar. Uh, I, I also want to, um, before we get to the Q&A section, I'm going to actually post a, um, a link in the chat for everybody um, if they're interested in purchasing a, a copy of the book. Um, so, because I'm... That was a lot of information that was interesting all the way through, and I'm sure that that, that your book is just chock full of, of more substantive information that at least I am interested in, and I'm sure there's many others. Uh, so just give me one second. We're going to message this to everybody. Okay, so that is in everybody's chat, um, which is perfect. Um, so the first question I got for you um, 
is, um, can you tell us how and why Nairobi and India were uh, following the civil war that was happening in America? Um, yeah. Just a little more in depth on that. Yeah, there, there were kind of two, two streams of thought. I mean, you know, if you were a merchant, uh, especially in a place like Bombay, you know, it was a great thing for you because you got rich. Uh, you know, th th there was something called share mania in Bombay. Uh, and, and in fact, a lot of Bombay, as we know today, was formed by indirectly the American Civil War. Land reclamation was funded by it. You know, new buildings came up. Uh, but, you know, political thinkers in India, by and large, were, you know, were all for the North. Uh, you know, again, they, they saw parallels between American slavery and British colonialism. Um, especially a lot of lower caste individuals in India actually saw direct comparisons between the African-American experience uh, and their experience both, you know, in British, you know, British India and also within the caste system. Uh, so, you know, when most, you, you see a lot of Indians writing favorably about Lincoln. Uh, when Lincoln is killed, uh, you know, a lot of Americans, uh, a lot of Indians express support and sympathy for Lincoln. Uh, so it's something that, you know, stays in, in, in memory of, uh, you know, Indians uh, who are thinking about politics. So, and it's, it, it's interesting. Uh, and then, so next we got, um, is there, could you maybe go a little bit more in depth um, into why Nairoji uh, championed the, the Irish home rule before he pushed for Indian uh, independence? Was there a specific strategic reasons that he was doing that for? It, it, to a large degree, it was strategic. So um, the constituency that Nairoji campaigned from had a lot of Irish people living in it. You know, there, there's a large Irish population in London, uh, and, you know, most of them supported Irish home rule. You know, like Indians, they saw how British rule had made them very poor. Um, uh, home rule allowed for some uh, modicum of independence for Ireland. Uh, and so, you know, the best way to get support from people who could vote for you is to, you know, agree with their number one political demand. Um, you know, and you know, and, and you know, once you've done that, you could also make the case that India deserves something like home rule. Yeah. Um, so another one that we just had come in was: um, Could you tell us what was happening, uh, if you know, what was happening in Delhi and Calcutta at the time? So um, Calcutta and Bombay and, and Madras, or today's Chennai, were the three major cities of India. Um, all the way up to the 20th century. Um, at, you know, in, in, the, in the 1800s and the early 1900s, Delhi was actually quite a backwater. Uh, you know, it, was a, it was a relatively small town. It, it had been a big city, but you know, it had suffered the most, one of the most from you know, British rule and you know, impover impoverishment. Uh, so it was, it was a pretty backward place in, until the 1920s. Um, but in, in Calcutta and Madras and Bombay, uh, you had similar groups of educated Indians who, you know, appreciate certain aspects of British rule, education, um, you know, the ability to communicate in the English language, political ideas, um, economic, you know, integration, uh, but at the same time saw a lot of stuff that was wrong. Um, so they were all talking to each other. I mean, you know, even though India did not have a fully existent railway system, you know, they were still mailing each other, they were writing to each other's newspapers, they didn't speak each other's languages, but they communicated over English, uh, yeah. and they shared political ideas. So, and I'm curious because a lot of Nairobi's ideas are, are parallels that are, I feel like are, there's, there's still issues and um, topics that are uh, happening today, right, that are, are just as current and um, as of much value as they were then as they are now. Um, but so is there a specific reason in your opinion um, why you think, um, or I, I'm assuming this, but do the Indian people... Um, is there not as much recognition of his impact um, for one specific reason? Like, is it just because his, his work and his um, activism and political importance um, was not, I, I don't know. It, to me, how you tell the story, it's, it's really not attractive, but it's really, I mean, there's highs, there's lows, there's a narrative that you can follow that's really interesting. So I'm curious as to why uh, maybe not so many people know as much. Um. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting thing. So at least in, in Indian history that's taught here in India, um, you know, uh, people like Gandhi or Jawaharlal Nehru tend to dominate uh, the narrative. Um, uh -huh. A lot of the people who were important before Gandhi uh, are kind of forgotten. You know, I mean, they're, they're just too many people. I mean, un unlike in America, you know, the movement for independence took place over, you know, 
80 years, <laughs> you know, so, you know, imagine, you know, imagine if, you know, 80, you know, for 80 years before Washington, Jefferson, Franklin, et cetera, you had a whole, you, you, you had, you know, whole other generations of them. Yeah. So, you know, quite naturally, they, they got kind of forgotten, um, you know, and there are many reasons for, what, for why this generation is, is not very well remembered. Um, politics changed dramatically. I mean, people like Nairobi were still thinking about how British rule could actually be good in some aspects. And by Gandhi's generation, people are saying, no, that's, that's not true at all. It's, it's, you know, it's bad. We need to get rid of it. So there are multiple factors of work. Yeah. Interesting. Well, I, I just want to, uh, I want to thank you for this today, because this has been really interesting. And it's definitely a, a wonderful way to start my uh, Thursday afternoon is, is getting to listen to this lecture. And I'm sure a lot of our members feel the same way. Um, so I just want to uh, thank you and appreciate you for um, the work that you've put into this book and the work that you've done to uh, make this event happen. Um, and I do also want to mention, I'm glad that you showed uh, the Punch comic. Um, because I know we have a pretty extensive punch comic collection here at the library. So after this, I'm actually going to go into the vaults and see if um, we have that issue. Um, and if oh, we, you'll be, you'll be getting an email from me later with, uh, with our copy of it, at least. Um, Fantastic. But, uh, I, I think it's, this is a really interesting topic and it, it's, it's important to tell these stories. And I'm, I'm glad that um, we got to have you here, even though um, it, it, you're not in South Carolina. We're very happy to have you coming from India and Mumbai. Um, so I want to thank you. I implore anybody who's interested to purchase their uh, a, purchase a copy of the book. You have the link in the um, the chat right now. If you have any questions about how to purchase a copy, you can call the library or you can call Bucks and Books. Um, we're at 164 King Street and 160 King Street. We're right downtown. Um, but so, Dinara, I just want to thank you one more time. Um, and I hope you have a wonderful evening and thank you again. Thank you. And, and I just like to, again, thank the Library Society and Anne and, and Dutch and Laura for organization of this event. Um, you know, it's, I, I, again, I wish I could have been there. Um, and I, I look forward to coming, you know, coming and visiting Charleston again once all of this is over. Absolutely. We, you know, we'll be gladly welcome back and we'll have another event and we'll, we'll, we'll do it for you. Absolutely. Thank you. Well, have a great day, everybody, um, and, and stay safe.